Let's get straight to the point with views from both sides of the aisle. We now welcome Lucian Smith and Brandon Jones to our MPB studios. Lucian is an attorney, a former senior advisor to Governor Haley Barber, and former chief of staff to Governor Phil Bryant. Brandon is an attorney, a former Democratic member of the Mississippi House, and a proud fan of the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. That's right. Gentlemen, welcome, welcome to that issue. Good to be here. All right. Let's start real quick, briefly, on um, primaries were this week. Uh, no surprises there. Uh, the big question was, you know, Roger Wicker, Senator Roger Wicker, uh, facing uh, a, a, a stable of, of challengers, endorsement from pres uh, former President Trump. He carried this carried well over 50 percent, carried, I think, 60 percent. Uh, Lucian, as a Republican, did the Trump endorsement help him, you know, stay off to challengers that seemingly were from the right side of the party? I think Roger was going to be fine regardless. I mean, certainly a Trump endorsement in a Republican primary doesn't hurt. Um, but the fact that you saw uh, Pontotoc, Tishomingo County, a, f a few of the areas that were real Trump strongholds in northeast Mississippi not go overwhelmingly for Roger, to me, indicates that it, it really didn't have that big of an effect. I think I think Roger's voters showed up. He got over 60 percent, and he's going to win in November. No question. He's strong. I mean, as somebody who's worked on a campaign against Senator Wicker mm -hmm. before, I can tell you firsthand, pretty, pretty tough out. Um, but this this Trump endorsement stuff is not a joke in the Republican Party. It, I mean, there's there's no question that Trump holds sway over Republican primary voters. And you have people um, across the party who are looking for his help. Uh, and, and certainly in Mississippi, you would assume that it wakes people up. I, I guess one thing that I think about as an, a, an observer of these elections is how low the turnout just is. Right. I, I mean, when you, when you we, we've drawn ourselves into uncompetitive congressional districts across the country. And as a result, it's just hard to get people fired up about these affairs. So you just see less than a third turnout. And, you know, you, you hate that. But. It's just kind of a product of where we are. Well, and it was, it's basically numerically where we were six years ago. Um, even though it's a presidential election year, the presidential election's over. And so the real draw was the, the presidential primary is over. Right. So the real draw was the Senate race, kind of like 18. And I think we were within two or 3,000 votes of the number of people who showed up in 18. It's just that core group who doesn't miss a primary. Yeah. Is that going to be indicative of what November is going to look like? Or do you think now when the general comes around, people will be energized to vote? Look, I, I mean, we're. Trump is is a um, a galvanizing figure on both sides of the aisle. I mean, it's it's just and, and it's hard to think of an election where he's on the ballot and stands to hold office that doesn't drive people out to the polls. I, I, yeah, I think turnout will be well up for the November general election. I, I think people show up for general elections, especially in a presidential election year. But I think you know, senators, I'm sure, don't like to hear this, but senators are not a draw for a primary election. <laughs> no, they don't want to hear that. People don't show up for that, but That's they right. do show up for a presidential election. They will in November. All right. Yeah. And, and, and I always think about how in Mississippi, too, we have off-year elections. So a, a lot of states across the country, they have all of their local elections mm -hmm. and their state elections at the same time. We're one of those handful of unique pockets where we don't do that, which... Um, I don't know. It's just another interesting nugget as we think about November. And I, th I think that's an interesting uh, piece to segue um, on because uh, speaking of the off-year election, we had one last year, um, and all of the you know, Republican uh, statewide office holders um, were pretty essentially reelected: lieutenant governor, governor, secretary of state, uh, treasurer, attorney general, all of them, the whole slew of them. Um, of all of them, Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman by far uh, received – the most of the electorate, I think 61.3% was the final number of the electorate he got. And now he's, and I bring that up because he's in this space right now as the Senate has declined after the Lieutenant Governor came out and said that they had a plan for Medicaid expansion. The Senate has declined to take up its its dummy bill, its its code section bill that uh, that they passed out of committee. Um, and so, I mean, I, I want to look at this as from from a, you know, legislative power uh, perspective of Brandon. Um, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, has has said and, he, and essentially you know was is part of i mean it's well known through four previous years that that he's for some type of expansion even if he didn't want to call it that um is it you know when you look at what's happening should he wield more power knowing that it, he carried more vote than any other republican statewide office holder and that that you know he likes to kind of leave things alone to to to, to his chairman to the to the members to do their thing but um, you know, legislatively, is this, a, is this place you would like to see him wield more power? 
Absolutely. I, I'm perplexed by Lieutenant Governor Hoseman's handling of Medicaid expansion dilution. I, you know, you, you've known him a long time. I've known him a long time. Um, he ha, He's a commanding presence. He, he's unquestionably, to your point a moment ago, a popular political figure. And, and I think he's performed that way in virtually every election he's been on statewide. I think, you know, this is this has been the trajectory he's been on. People like him. Um, and you would love to see him use that bully pulpit to get folks around this idea of expansion because i do agree that this is something well i you know, I agree he's, he's told us in the past that he favors some version of expansion it's it's interesting lucian he's so active on certain things like i recall i would handle some of y'all's legislation when he was secretary of state and man he was all in the weeds he's he's a he's a tinkerer he likes to get in there no i don't, I don't like that line let's do this um and he certainly has shown that at times in the Senate. But then you have these huge moments where the pressure's turned up and suddenly he seems to fade into the background. And that, that part of it is odd to me. And I guess I've noticed that in particular around this issue of expansion this session. So I don't get it. I would love to see him flex because we know he's capable of that. I, I, I don't view the what happened with the bill today necessarily as being a loss for the lieutenant governor. I mean, he. my understanding of what Chairman Blackwell said is they're going to wait and take the House vehicle when it comes over. They're going to put us they're going to do a strike all where they'll delete the House language, put the Senate position back in and send it back over. I mean, I suspect that two things are at play. One is there's certainly an awful lot of pressure to get the bill done. And he's been very clear on where he is on it. I, I suspect the votes were a little bit shaky and they're going to take the time between now and when we get to the second set of floor deadlines to, to try to get the votes right. I, I I don't know that necessarily the fact they didn't move the bill today means that the bill won't move. I think we will have expansion at some point. Yeah, and I think I mean that, that was the and that, that's part of the I think the calculus I was asking Brandon is that you know this doesn't this, this doesn't necessarily mean the Medicaid expansion is dead, but does it show a little bit reveal pull the curtain back a little bit of where the Senate and where that body is on this on this issue? Well, it certainly would support Lucian's theory that the vote count must be tight because otherwise, why aren't we? rolling a bill out. It's hard as an observer of the process to say, man, we've been in this for 10 years. Of all the various issues bouncing around over there, this is one that we've talked about quite a bit. It's been briefed fully. We have numerous states, including sister states in our area that have expanded. And so it's not like we don't have models. So the, the fact that we're this long into this conversation nationally and there's not something on paper, it's a little disconcerting. But possibly in service to trying to get the votes. And Lucian, that's what I was going to ask. I'm, the subtext here is the Senate is aware it's going to have to have a veto-proof majority. And so it's not just getting a majority. They're trying to get a super majority behind something that they can pass. Well, and this is pure uh, supposition, not, not anything that I know for a fact, but we know that the governor is opposed to Medicaid expansion. Governor Reeves has made that very clear. But I suspect he also does not want to get overridden because as soon as a governor, especially a second-term governor, gets overridden on a major policy issue, they're essentially the king of England for all Open for season. all legislative purposes. I mean, they they serve no point. So I sus it wouldn't surprise me the governor, being a former lieutenant governor, hasn't been talking to some of his former members mm -hmm. and yeah. saying, yeah. "Don't put yourself in a vulnerable position in a primary for something I'm going to veto." And that that may be the reason that they're going to wait until the second. Uh, floor deadline to really see action there. And, and he's a much more effective lobbyist we've seen in the Senate than in the House. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's obvious he's that— He spent eight I, years in that in that chamber. That's right. right. And, and it's pretty obvious that House members are kind of game. Like, they're they're ready for an override. I, I mean, I, I get the impression over there, they're, they're, they're ready for an override on pick your subject. Yeah. But uh, the Senate is different. These are colleagues. These are people he's appointed to chairmanships. These are people who worked with in the past, and he's clearly having some effect. But there again, that's why I'm, I just say it— I feel like this is a great opportunity for Hoseman to kind of bow up and show, hey, you don't run this, you don't run this body. I'm in charge of the Senate, and and I think he could be effective in counterbalancing some of the governor's lobbying. And I guess we don't know to the extent that's going on. Right. He certainly hasn't been vocal that that's what he's doing. And I, I guess from the outside, you just don't yeah. don't know what's happening. And then I guess real quick, crystal ball, um, the, the the Senate takes up. Uh, the House bill, they they put together something. 
Um, yeah, I guess they're going to have to put together something in conference eventually. But uh, let's say that the Senate can't get to the two thirds. I mean, do they do they let it die or do they vote and still put it in the hands of the governor? If it were if it were me and I couldn't get the votes in the lieutenant go- in the in the Senate, what I would think the lieutenant governor would do would be come out with a study committee that says we've got to have more data on who the expansion population is so we can make a fully informed decision. We don't want to rush into this. And for that reason, our position is now going to be the study committee. And we're going to come back in the 25 session with all the data we need to make a fully informed decision. I mean, Lucian, just seamless. A great historian <laughs> of the legislative process. Uh, he sounds like a guy that's been whispering in the ear of leaders for a while. The The great white flag of the legislative process is the study committee. We, we have more study committees than you can shake a stick out over there. And typically, Lucian's exactly right. Those are for issues that prove too controversial to pass. But strong enough that there were some people over there that wanted to keep it alive. Mm-hmm. It would be a real shame, though, just getting to the core policy here. It, it seems we've reached a tipping point where there's alignment between the general public, between medical professionals. Between, who are there at the Capitol today. That's right. And, and I presume a majority of the legislature who appreciate that it's time for expansion. And so... It would be a real missed opportunity if we let another year pass without this billion dollar infusion of resources to our state's health care you know, facilities and, and to providing coverage for people who fall within these coverage gaps. So I, I hope that we're just not seeing it all and there's plenty of time left in the session and something comes out of the Senate. But right now it's kind of all eyes on the Senate. And I'd say whatever your substantive views are on Medicaid expansion, based on what the Lieutenant Governor said and the Speaker has said, we are going to have Medicaid expansion. It's just a question of when and how, whether it's this session, next session, sometime in the next few years. I think it's it's inevitable at this point. All right, let's shift to um, to a bill that the House uh, sent out this week regarding PERS, uh, the you know, basically the, the benefit system for public uh, employees and retirees. Uh, there is a bill there to shake it up a lot. Uh, you know, the House legislation uh, creates a, a new board uh, of appointed officials, uh, and it also um, there, there, there's a PERS has said that some context PERS says it needs more revenue, it needs an infusion of cash, and one of those pieces was a phased in five percent employer contribution. Two uh, percent of that was slated to begin in July. This this legislation from the House uh, cuts that. So um, as the legislature kind of takes on PERS, and, and Speaker White said that was one of the things that this House was going to look at, was going to look at PERS. And before the session, I mean, you know, there, there were uh, with meetings with PERS Executive Director Higgins, I and mean, there were conversations between, um, you know, all the leadership about the, the, the state of PERS. Uh, Brandon, what does this House movement, you're a former member of the House, what does this 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 legislation from the House say uh, about the the legislature's attitude and, and outlook on PERS? Well, some sometimes we get excited because there's this bucket of issues that we say the speaker wants to address. And I feel like every week in here we're saying, <laughs> well, Jason White is taking yeah. on a new part of government. He's, he's, he's been a busy guy. <laughs> um, but it's not always great. I, I, I think you, you made the point, and this is certainly true, the economist who addressed the bodies last week, and I think for the last several years have been saying, you're going to have to find a way to put more revenue in this program. Um, part of the way you do that is through the employer contribution. Um, and so it was a fairly modest 2% increase, as you said, that was going to es- – there's an escalator attached to it. So it's interesting that one of the first things we do to fix PERS is to go against the advice of the economists who have been saying you got to find more re- – so that part's weird. The other part that's interesting is the way that this uh, – oversight body has been composed up to this point has been primarily through election of different parts of the PERS population who are in the program. And if you think about it, I mean, from my perspective, that makes a lot of sense. These are people who are in the program, they understand the program, and they understand the uh, demographic they represent. So whether it be school teachers or community colleges or whatever part of that PERS network they come from, and it's over 350,000 people. I mean, there's a good chance that a lot of the people listening to this program right now are in the system. It's a huge system in the state. I kind of liked the idea of having that representative class overseeing it. This certainly, Lucian, to me, looks like a more political turn. I mean, this body becomes more political when you put it in the hands of the governor, the lieutenant governor, the treasurer. It, obviously, those people would have a majority control now of the new board. 
And, you know, for a state that has this recent history of <laughs> having weird deals with friends, I hate the idea of PERS falling into a political situation where, you know, friends might get the, the account or whatever the case may be. I, I don't know. I, it, th those are the types of things that concern me when you start changing the composition of the board. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea to change the composition of the board. And, and the primary reason, and you're right, the folks who are on the board now with one exception, I think, well, the tr two exceptions, the treasurer and the governor's appointee, are people who are either current retirees or current uh, future retirees, current employees of the state. And so they've never really had an incentive as a board to try to figure out a different system to get things to an adequate funding level other than raising the employer contribution. And the problem with that, we phrase it as we're raising the employer contribution. Well, sure, who cares if the employer has to put a little bit more into the system? Well, the employer is you and me. So every dollar that they have to put additional into the system is less money going to the highway patrol. It's less money going into classroom teachers. It's less money going to produce great content like at issue at Mississippi uh, Public Broadcasting because mm -hmm. it's money that's moving out of one public budget over to it being taken out we, for the purse. We've heard that there's a that there's this surplus that there's this I mean, that there's all this all fiscal fiscally responsible um, policy has has created this um, like created this surplus. Is this would this not be a, a good use of that? First, I don't know that the surplus is enough to get you to adequate funding levels. Um, I also think as you start to see increases in other areas, if we're going to expand Medicaid, which is a possibility, if we're going to keep increasing funding to education, which we should, I mean, all of that is going to start eating into the available surpluses. And I think the thinking on changing the board composition is by having a group of uh, people whose primary responsibility is not to represent a group of beneficiaries, but to have a fiduciary duty to the solvency of the board, you might end up with them coming back with better proposals than what you're getting now, which is essentially just take more money out of the general fund and put it into PERS. It, it is, it's worth mentioning, I think, and I think the reason that investments in PERS do make sense and, and why the state does want to do this is because it makes these jobs more attractive. I mean, this this system is one of the things that attracts people to public service Absolutely. employment. And so you want to have a vibrant retirement system for your public employees. It's a type of service. It's a type of, you know, government service. And you want it to be something where it incentivizes people who might have other options um, and so I think it is worth our investment. I, I think as taxpayers, it's a type of thing where I would say, yeah, you get what you pay for in government, right? I'm also a person who thinks you should raise the pay for legislators because you get what you pay for. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I, I hope that as we move along, we see the state acknowledging its obligation to keep this system in, in good financial stead and that an employer enhancement is part of that formula, um, but yeah, we'll see. We got a long way to go. I mean, I, I, I believe that Lieutenant Governor's comments again today were, we'll have to see mm -hmm. what they did. Yep. So, you know, who knows? Keep, keep in mind that the employer contribution has nearly doubled over the course of the last 15 years. I mean, it is a significantly larger part of, of your tax dollars end up going to fund PERS right now. But I absolutely agree with you. The system has to be solvent. We have to honor our promises. And I don't think anybody in leadership is contemplating a scenario where we go back to retirees and say, well, we promised you this, but it's actually going to be 80% of this. I think it is a contract. It's constitutionally guaranteed. And there's there's no expectation that anybody in leadership would even think about break, breaching that contract. And, and I just want, I want to say this, Michael. Yeah, I, did, I did notice that it's not like they're about to have to turn off the lights. I mean, sometimes right. we talk about these programs and it, it is dire and it's like, well, if we, you know, we got rural hospitals closing, right. we have to do something. Well, that's true. Uh, PERS is not like that. I think I was reading there is $3 billion in holdings and then like $100 million in debts. Um, I, I would kill for that ratio at my house. Um, <laughs> but I mean, the point is, it is right. solvent for the I mean, it, it, it is able to you know, honor its obligations right now. So I think that's an important point. Don't want listeners to get alarmed that something's right. changing in the moment. But it's, again, it's been a constant source of conversation, and we'll see. Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, public employees, you know, when they hear anything about changes to PERS, obviously um, their ears perk up and they, they want to know what's going on. Um, in the Senate, um, we had a couple of bills uh, over the course of the, you know, up to this de this deadline day, this general bill deadline day, uh, focus on higher ed, and that um, in in lots of ways raise a lot of questions about the future of higher ed in Mississippi. Uh, Senator Polk introduced a bill that died in committee uh, that, but that it proposed, you know, eliminating 
three public universities. And then uh, and then on the Senate floor this week, we saw a bill that originated as a, a vehicle to move the Mississippi uh, School of Math and Science to Mississippi State, turn into a bill to um, have state absorb the university for women. Um, that that all that 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 died. Um, but I think this legislation, at least for the first time in a couple of years, you know, is raising questions about the state of higher ed and how this how this legislature, um, as it's composed, going into this you know four year term, is going to you know value higher education and especially the the small smaller regional schools. So. Um, I started with Brandon last time, so I'll start with you, you, Lucian. Um, you know, is there anything to make out of out of this type of legislation being filed and the questions it's raising, and how how the state is kind of looking at higher ed? I think it's good that uh, the legislature is looking at the question. I think it's a it is an incredibly politically fraught question. I, I worked for Governor Barber when he proposed shutting down the four non comprehensive universities mm-hmm. and just having. Uh, the four big universities remain, and it, I, it is what it is rare to see that large of a number of people come to the Capitol to protest something that the legislature is considering. It's not an easy political subject. I do think it's a good discussion for us to have, uh, especially because enrollment is down significantly at the W Delta State. And I think we have to ask ourselves, even though those are important institutions, they're incredibly meaningful to uh, the people who attend them, who did attend them, who work at them, but whether it's in the best interest of the state to continue to fund eight universities statewide. Um, And I think that's going to be a very difficult question to answer. But things are different now. I mean, you can get a comprehensive uh, education online. People are, you know, not everybody is getting the education they need by going and living at a university for four years, even though there's a lot of value in that. And so I think there is a legitimate question with a finite amount of dollars, ought we continue to operate eight universities in a state as small as we are? Brandon. This is not the PR tour that the Mississippi University for Women wanted. I mean, the session started out with them asking for a new name and right. it nearly concluded with them not having a school. Um, it, it is indicative, though, of lower high school graduation rates, uh, lower birth rates, which are starting to catch up with, with what we're seeing in schools. Um the financial arrangement at our colleges and universities, this was something that I was interested to learn. About 60% of our state universities' funding used to come from the state. Now that number has been reversed so that 60% or more comes from tuition. And in the case of some schools, it's led them to really go hard after out-of-state students to to drive up that number because right. they can ask for two or three times in-state tuition. So uh, that's it. That's an interesting place to find yourself. And then to Lucian's point, there are folks who are kind of wondering if it's worth the investment. You know, Lucian, our generation has been strapped with just historic levels of student debt that people pay on into their 60s. Um, there's a there's a conversation going on out among young people. It's like, hey, do I want to start out that way? Especially if I don't know what I want to, what I want to do. Um, so there's a lot of these factors that are coming to bear on this thing. Um, it sounds like we're going in the way, once again, of a study committee. That's what it sounded like to me. I, I was yeah. listening to Senator Boyd, who I think has the baton on this issue over in the Senate, and it sounded like— Yeah, she is the chair of colleges and universities in the Senate. Right. Even and, though this bill that was nixed yesterday came from the House Education— I mean, the, the Senate Education Committee chaired by DeBar because it started off as that MSMS— Vehicle. Yeah, I it's mean, weird. It's, it's a lot of weird things happening. Well, you have you had a few players. You had, you had Senator Barr's bill, and then you had Senator John Polk, mm-hmm. who who had a bill. And John Polk's an interesting figure in this legislative process. He does not appear to be invested in making friends outside of the Capitol. I mean, he he runs <laughs> into the fire virtually every <laughs> controversial issue that emanates from the Senate. Polk is in there somewhere kind of curmudgeonly saying, yeah, this is what we're going to do, and if you don't like it, you can vote me out next time. Um, but it sounds like Boyd killed his bill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to argue against looking at something more closely. I, I, I don't yeah. I don't know that that's something that we should not be in favor of, but I do understand the uh, trepidation of graduates of these institutions that appear to be – on the chopping block or that were kind of threatened. And and there's there's another piece to this story that's important. You have a large contingent within that uh, legislative uh, body that has been 
just raising cane about those dollars that were supposed to be designated for historical black colleges and universities to do uh, different upkeep mm-hmm. at these places. And, you know, there's a pretty convincing argument to be made that these places are owed dollar, dollars, Alcorn right. State at the top of that list. And one of the reasons that people cite for a decrease in student population is, well, the facilities are running down. And so there is a bit of a chicken and an egg mm-hmm. conversation. And, and some some of our uh, members of the legislature have spoken very eloquently to this. If we don't have the resources to build up some of these places, then, you know, that's going to be reflected in the student population. So that's kind of a tandem argument that I think is getting some traction. And I think we might hear more about that as the session moves along. Yeah, I think the W trying to change their name, you're right, is what kind of kicked it off. But it sort of illustrated the point, right? I mean, their argument is we've got to change the name from the Mississippi University for Women because we're struggling to attract students. I mean, to my mind, and I'm going to probably hear from my various aunts who went to MSCW back when it was called that, but (laughs) to my mind, the right answer is to have it be the Mississippi State University W campus in Columbus and start merging those, uh, start merging those functions and having le- and more tax dollars go to education and less go to administration. But I think that is something that needs to be explored, not something that pops out in a committee substitute at the last minute and all of a sudden you shut down a university that's been there for 100 years. Yeah, that was Lucian Smith that said that, <laughs> not Brandon Jones, big fan of the W. And, and, last, and this might be getting really inside baseball, but when we're talking about these mergers and stuff like that, you know, uh, you know, at what level do legislators have an understanding of the types of in like the types of higher ed institutions, right? I mean, Mississippi State is a research institution. Uh, the W and Delta State, I mean, they were founded as like more like academic institutions. Like their, their, their missions are very different. How do you consolidate that if you're talking about mergers? I think that's a valid question, but that is that is the nature of the American political system. Uh, certainly any system where you've got uh, state universities, you're going to have elected officials who are, may or may not be subject matter experts who ultimately are making the decision. And that, I think that probably bolsters the case for some sort of – I mean, this may be one of the moments where a study committee is yeah, the right study decision committee. Study so committee. you can hear from people who are who are the subject matter experts yeah. and then separately look and say, is this the best use of, of taxpayer dollars? Yeah, if you, if you stroll over to the Capitol or turn on YouTube to watch it, you'll, you'll realize we're, we're, we're not just, you know, rolling around in experts. Um, it's, it's a citizen <laughs> legislature, a bunch of generalists over there. That's right. Yeah. It's like Bismarck said, if you like sausage or laws, you should never watch either one of them be made. Yeah, well, it's a good, good, good point. Yeah. All right, and that's a, that's a good point to end on. Uh, this has been At Issue on MPB Think Radio, a weekly discussion about the 2024 Mississippi legislative session. If you can't catch us live each Friday at 6.30, At Issue can be streamed on demand on the MPB Public Media app, or you can subscribe to the At Issue podcast. Each week's podcast includes an extended version of our weekly interview, as well as an extended version of our roundtable discussion. And if you'd like to see what we all look like the full interview and roundtable are available on YouTube. Just search Mississippi Public Broadcasting at issue. I'm Michael Gidry from all of us at MPB. Thanks for listening.